what people miss about having a huge, audacious goal is that it's hard to fail completely. I'm really thrilled to have you in my office. Thank you for having me. You're such an interesting character to me. I look at your story and it seems like you were on, at one point, a completely different path and you had sort of like a breakdown of sorts or you just said, I'm done with this. Well, I feel like I have a midlife crisis every six months or so. Every six but, months. But in 2004, I was definitely just a few years out of school five years out of school at that point and working myself to the bone in Silicon Valley, doing the usual shtick 24-7. And uh, had a soon-to-be fiance, or so I thought, walk out, and then complete meltdown ensued, and then did a walkabout around the world for about a year and a half. And uh, during that time, yeah, made a lot of decisions that changed my trajectory. But How were you going about making those decisions at that time? Because yeah. I think that a lot of us know at some point that we're at a tipping point or something mm -hmm. needs to change, but getting to the what and yeah. the how is really complicated. It's challenging, yeah. We very often look at the risks of action or the potential downside of action, and that's the only analysis we do, but it's really important to look at the costs of inaction. So, okay, let's say you don't do this thing. Let's telescope out six months, a year, three years. What does your life look like? Is it better or worse? And in my case, it was worse, 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 if I kept doing what I was doing. The first book is The Four Hour Work Week. Yeah. How did you come to four hours of all, I mean, did you, you had to have test case that a little bit with oh, yeah. people like, what sounds good? How many hours well, could you handle working? Well, all right, so the funny, the funny part about this title is it was one of maybe 20 different potential titles, but it started off as a two hour work week because that was literally how much time I was spending at the end of a year and a half managing this company with distribution in something like 12 countries. And I was chatting with uh, someone at my publisher at the time, Crown, and they said, two hours just sounds, it sounds really unrealistic. And I was like, four <laughs> hours? And they're like, yeah, now we're talking. That's totally realistic. Now we're talking. Yeah. So I was like, okay. And uh, ran with it. It was, keep in mind, turned down by 27 publishers. Yes. I, and, I know this part of yeah, your story because yeah, yeah. it's very part, a big part of yeah. overcoming. It just wasn't expected to do anything. So I thought like four-hour work week, okay, like it'll sell a few thousand copies. Um, then I'll move, move on with my life, get back to my life, and uh, here we are. Now I'm forever the four-hour guy. So the blessing and the curse. Well, and four hours applies to multiple things apparently, not apparently. just your work week. Yeah, for our body, for our chef, and really, I mean, what we're talking about is trying to 10x the hourly output of whatever you're doing. So it's not necessarily about working as little as possible. I work with a lot of the fastest growing startups on the planet. They're clearly not working four hour work weeks. But if I can say, look, I can show you how to say, extract 10x the conversion in a given activity so that you are hockey sticking at a rate that is, is far in excess of your top two competitors, that's interesting to them. And the, the toolkit is the same in either case. Are you a workaholic? Because no. when I hear you talk about your life, yeah. it sounds like you're working all the time. So I, I'm not a workaholic. Well, actually, let me rephrase. I think that um, kind of like being an alcoholic, like once a workaholic, always a workaholic, in the sense that you don't want to go where it's slippery if you don't want to slip. So I have to have coping mechanisms. I will set extended periods off the grid and vacations as far as a year in advance. And uh, what's important to realize too about doing that, the, the benefit is not just that you can uh, defend yourself against your lesser self, this workaholic uh, who just wants to drive, drive, hard charge at all costs. You also get the benefit of anticipation, which is like 90% of the experience. When you have a year to look forward to something, it improves your day-to-day -day quality of life tremendously. So I block out a lot of that. I also, for instance, will take Saturdays or my screen-free days, no computers, uh, generally no apps unless I need it for transportation like you know, Uber or Google Maps or something. You kinda, at this point in time, you need those. Uh, but that's my screen-free Saturdays. So that, that is what it is. You always, you always ask people about their routines, their morning yeah. routine. So I want to know what's your morning routine. Yeah, uh, I wake up, 
I make my bed. Do 20 minutes of meditation, generally transcendental meditation, I might use something like Headspace. That is very important for me, just to rehearse being non-reactive so that I'm more proactive and less emotional during the day. So I'll do that. Then I'll make tea, and the tea is very specific, which is uh, pu'er tea, which is black tea, plus a pinch of dragon well green tea, uh, plus turmeric and ginger. And then once that's steeped, which only takes about, let's say, 30 to 60 seconds for the first steeping, <laughs> I'll add one to two tablespoons of coconut oil. All of that is for optimizing brain function in the short and long term. Then I'll sit down and I'll do morning journaling. And that either takes the form of something called morning pages, which a lot of creatives, like superstar screenwriters and producers and artists recommended to me, which is, is really profound, or something called the five minute journal, which is five minutes in the morning, so pre-game prep, and five minutes at night, which is post-game. And that's my morning routine. You do this every day? I do those elements almost every day. But uh, what I, what I, the way I look at almost all these things is it's not 100% or zero. So if I get even one or two of those, ideally three, and there are a few other components, but like if I knock off three of those, the likelihood of me having a home run of a day or a day that I consider a home run is twice what it would be otherwise, three times. You got to have the tea, though. The tea I, is a must. The tea, I love the tea. But otherwise, I would just say, in general, another pattern is that the people I interviewed, whether their morning starts at 4 a.m. or 11 a.m., mm -hmm. uh, if you win the morning, you win the day. I love the podcast, too, because you Thank take you. problems, essentially your the questions that you're facing, oh, totally and you're just like, problems. who do I call to solve this problem that I'm having that's probably universal? And you just find people who are the best people to give you those answers. Yeah, yeah, and they're super. I don't even worry about they might be universal part. I mean, literally, <laughs> I was having. I, was, I had a couple of challenges uh, with, uh, and not major challenges, but I adopted this puppy named Molly, and I thought that almost every book on dog training was pure garbage. They were just completely made up, nothing to back them up. You're just mm looking for free help. I'm just looking for free help. So the <laughs> podcast is really my way to get free help. Sounds like you're living the dream. I'm having a blast. The podcast is my favorite part of writing without the writing. I do all this research. And then <laughs> I kind of promised myself I wouldn't write more books. <sighs> and uh, Why is that? They're hard. I find writing really hard. I find it really punishing. And I spend a lot of time in my head as it is. And it's healthy for me to interact with other people. But when I'm isolated for long periods of time to write. I find it really uh, emotionally challenging and psychologically challenging. But I set aside a month uh, to go through all of my notes from these podcast guests. Some of it was the transcripts, like 10,000 pages, but literally. But wow. other, other parts were these conversations or collaborations I had with all these people after the podcast. So a lot of it was not from the podcast. And I wanted to just create a cliff notes for myself. All of the, the sort of highest impact tactics and routines and so on that I wanted to refer to constantly and I got halfway through it and I was like okay this thing's 150,000 words and it's for myself like <laughs> this is what my readers and listeners want and that's how Tools of Titans actually came to be so here we are. Of all the titans that mm -hmm. you've spoken to over the years uh, names that you would all know. Yeah. Well, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Jamie Foxx, Edward Norton. You've got the celebrities and then a bunch of folks you might not know like black market chemists and uh, super athletes that you should know about hospice doctors who've helped a thousand plus people die and have actually learned a lot about how to live, that kind of stuff. So it's all of my favorite gems and actionable tactics from all of those people. On how to live your best life, essentially. Yeah, in three sections, healthy, wealthy, and wise. So it's how to optimize all three of those things for yourself. You get into the process with your guests yeah. a lot. For you, what is your process? You said you had 10,000, is that it? Yeah. 10,000 pages? At least 10,000 pages. At least 10,000 pages. So how do you even attack the idea of the book? Do you think first headline, this is the book that I want to create, yeah. and how do I do it, and back into it from there? Uh, it's, it's very similar to how I choose my podcast guests. So I was given advice very early on by a guy who most people don't know by name, named Cal Fussman. He's the most incredible interviewer I've ever met. Mm. He was one of the principal writers of the What I Learned column for Esquire for about 20 years. Interviewed Gorbachev, people like De Niro, Ali, everybody. And at one point he lost boxes and boxes of notes for this huge story he was supposed to do about trying to become a sommelier for a week. And he was devastated. They all got mildewed and black. And he was talking to this novelist who was famous for doing a ton of drugs and alcohol just a rampant drug user, and uh, Cal asked him, how do you remember anything? 
because you're trying to do this research. How do you remember anything? And he said, we'll bleep this out, but the good shit sticks. And so Cal gave me that advice in the beginning because I was overwhelmed. And he said, just write what has stuck for you as a starting point. Mm -hmm. So I started there. Then I went through the transcripts and I identified the things I tested or that friends or fans of mine had tested and been able to replicate, really important. And uh, that is how it came together. But the, the vetting process was simple. Have I used it myself? Can it be replicated for other people? And is it something that's very, very specific? And I find this as a content creator myself, you want to get into those specifics and then you start to actually listen to the specifics back. Yeah. And it's so in the weeds at a certain point, yeah. you wonder if the audience is still there with you. So, all right, this is funny. So I, in the very beginning, was super nervous about doing the podcast, which I just did as a break from writing. I just wanted to be myself and have wine with my friends and get stupid and see what happens. Wine is an ongoing theme here. It is. I like this. wine. I like wine. But that I got sloppy in the first few episodes. It's really embarrassing. If you want to, if you want to hear a <laughs> bad example of how to do a podcast, listen to the first episode of the Tim Ferriss Show with Kevin Rose. It's atrocious. But the point being uh, that we got really into the weeds repeatedly, and I remember. Uh, I would be interviewing folks like Derek Sivers, who's an incredible entrepreneur and really like a philosopher king in a lot of ways, just a fascinating guy. And we could certainly talk a lot about him. I've learned a lot from him. But we got to maybe hour, I don't know, two and a half, three. And he said, no one is listening. If people have questions, here's my email address. And I told him, I said, you don't want to give out your email address. Wow, but at that point in the interview, he's maybe like, no one was he's listening. like, we're three hours in. We've been getting yeah. so deep in the weeds, no one's listening. He had to change his email address because he got thousands of emails. I'm like, I told you, people do listen. And here's the thing, when you're working with audio, it's different than video, mm -hmm. but audio is a secondary activity. People are running, they're walking the dog, they're washing the dishes, they're cooking, they're doing almost anything and listening. So they will stick with you if your stuff is good or if it's at least has portions that are good. Uh, and uh, that's been part of the challenge for me. It's just how do you do one take and not really edit and make something interesting for two, two and a half hours. What's the worst advice you've ever received? I'll give you a very specific example, but I think you can generalize it. I, in high school, I was very bad at standardized testing and never got great scores in most of those tests and spent a lot of time uh, catching up with summer schools and also spent a year abroad and none of those credits transferred. And I remember going in, but I had good grades in my other classes and I remember going into the guidance counselor when I was about to apply for college and uh, in preparation they had said, come in with your safety schools, like the C list, mm -hmm. come in with your I think I can get in schools, B, and then your reach schools, A. And so I came in and I had my list and uh, on the reach were schools like Stanford, Harvard, Princeton, et cetera. And the guidance counselor said, Tim, and he was kind of dismissive and not very, uh, not very cool about it, but he said, Tim, look, uh, you should take your C's and make them your A's. So your safety schools, those are gonna be your reach schools. And you need to lower your standards. Like you need to, uh, you need to lower your expectations because of A, B, C, D, and E. And I walked out really demoralized. I never went back to meet him a second time. And then this is what I realized. Guidance counselors want to be able to say a high percentage of their students got into their first choice schools. What's the easiest and laziest way to do that? It's to get students to lower their goals and expectations. That is terrible advice for students. Uh, ultimately, I had a, a... You went to Princeton. I went to Princeton. I applied and I bust my ass to do a good job in the application and I got in. And um, so looking back, it's like, no, no, no. Like if you, and this is actually from, uh, this is from Larry Page, so one of the co-founders of Google, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, what people miss about having a huge, audacious goal is that it's hard to fail completely. So when you have a huge, huge goal, it's hard to fail completely. You might, you might fail above everyone else's success.